Hello everyone, my name is Eddie Joe. I'm an intensive care doctor, and today's video is going to be about this cool technology that I just ran into called the ProTech Duo, this right here. So, first of all, to give some disclaimers, I am an intensive care doctor. I am not a cardiologist or an interventional cardiologist. I do not have anything to do whatsoever with the company that makes this. I do not own shares of their stocks. I am not a consultant. I do not speak for them. I'm not being compensated for this uh, discussion that I'm going to do. More than anything, a cardiologist who I met through Instagram brought this device up to me and I realized that there wasn't a good amount of data behind it and a good amount of, well, a good post or anything like that breaking it down. So I decided to take it upon myself to go ahead and go through the data. Now, the citations for everything I'm going to be saying here is on my website, eddiejoemd.com. It's also going to be in the description box below. So please double check my work. Let's get started. First of all, when it comes to right ventricular support for patients who are in right heart failure, for whatever etiology, we're only limited to a few options. Starting off with the pharmacological options being vasopressors and anotropes. You know, you could also try to diarrhea somebody to offload the RV a bit. But when it comes to mechanical circulatory support, we have two devices. One of them being the Impella RP and the other one being this device, the Protec Duo. Now, this device, the Protec Duo, is made by Tandem Life. I think they have a new name now called Levanova. And it is what we call an RVAD. Let's see if this writes an RVAD. RVAD stands for Right Ventricular Assist Device. And it is placed, as I mentioned, by an interventional cardiologist, an advanced heart failure cardiologist. It could be placed by intensivists or other people who have specialized training with this, dev with this device, okay? So this is what the catheter looks like. This actual image itself was taken from the Tandem Life website. So I apologize if I upset people with it. I'll take this video down if I do. But at the end of the day, this is actually placed in the right IJ, okay? Uh, the difference between this and say the impella is that the impella is placed in the femoral, uh, in femoral vein. And so what that leads to is the patient being unable to ambulate. Since this is in the right IJ, you do not have that problem. And so as you place this in the right IJ, you're going to go ahead and feed this catheter right here into, and I'm doing this like, you know, the first time around, into the main pulmonary artery, okay? And then it's gonna have an inflow, uh, inflow part right here, and then your outflow part is going to be over here. And that is how it's going to generate uh, flow for the right heart. So one of the ways it's described as is as being a right atrium to pulmonary artery bypass. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, again, this is the actual catheter itself. It comes in from what I believe to be two different sizes, being a uh, twenty nine French. If this decides to write for me. Nope, it's not going to write for me, but a 29 French or a 31 French. Oh, I see what I did. I was off the screen a little bit there. Okay, so now that we're done with this bad boy right here, as you can see, again, in the right IJ, and it bypasses from the right atrium to the pulmonary artery. And the way that this device ends up working, oh yeah, and by the way, when you actually go ahead and place this device, it has to be under fluoroscopy and transesophageal echocardiogram, so you could actually see it be placed in the main pulmonary artery, okay? And it helps confirm pr proper placement. For From what I've read, this could be placed up to six days per the FDA approval, okay? So the way that this works with regards to a pump, and here's the pump right there, uh, this works similar to the traditional ECMO circuits where it is a continuous flow pump along the lines of a centrifugal pump. I never say that word correctly, centrifugal, whatever. It, it differs from the impella devices because those are axial flow devices. And from what I've read, this could provide a flow of up to 4.5 liters per minute. Okay, so as I mentioned, introducing the IJ, uh, the cannula has a proximal inflow tract 
Going back over here, this is the proximal inflow tract. Let me do a different color. Let's do green. The proximal inflow tract right there, which sits in the right atrium. And this is the distal outflow lumen over here, which sits in the main pulmonary artery. But you're here because you want to take care of patients and me too. And I already talked about the flow rates. But now let's talk about the indications. From what I've read in the data, and again, these indications are... Uh, the indications that I've found reviewing through the data, please don't hold me accountable for this. Um, you know, not many places actually use this technology. Not many people are trained from what I've learned to use it as of the date of this recording, which is the 2nd of June of 2020. Um, right, it's June. Yeah, it is June. Check that out. Uh, but one of the one of the etiologies for which this has a function is for patients who are in RV failure secondary to a left ventricular device placement. From what I've read, up to 20% of patients who have an LVAD placed could go ahead and develop RV failure. And if the RV goes down, then the LV, would, under a certain matter of time, most likely will go down as well. The second indication, so that's indication number one. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. So the second indication is for patients who had open heart surgery and during open heart surgery, uh, cardi cardiotomy is the terminology, when they have open heart surgery, something happens to the RV and they might have the inability to close the chest because the RV is, uh, is dilated or you know the graft doesn't work properly or a number of reasons that a cardiothoracic surgeon could explain far better than I can. But you do see from time to time right heart failure after some sort of open heart surgery, and then this could potentially help with that. The other patient population are for those patients who have myocardial infarctions, you know, those that affect the RV or the inferior wall, and then they might also go into right heart failure. So that's somebody else to keep in mind. Uh, it could also be utilized in situations where Things don't go as well as one would like, status post heart and lung transplant, and you just need to give the person a little bit more support, you know, so that they could recover a bit more. Also, acute myocarditis is another indication for this, and, you know, that's a temporary thing, hopefully, for most people. As well as number six, I found this in a case report that it was utilized in somebody with severe pulmonary hypertension. Um, again, this goes back to this being a new technology and potentially not knowing exactly the indications where it can and cannot work properly. Because um, severe pulmonary hypertension, you have to have a way out. I don't know what, uh, I wasn't able to dig into the nitty gritty of the detail where they mentioned that, but it's just something for you to keep in mind. Again, if, if you need to look more into this data, I definitely suggest you contact the folks from Tandem Heart and them to give you some more information. So now we're going to go over the math part of all this, and I'm going to be talking about the PAPI score. And I like to call it PAPI because um, it's a pretty good bourbon. I want to say pretty good. It's amazing, but it's just spelled differently. So all right, let me close this down. So the PAPI score, it stands for um, Pulmonary Artery Pulsatility Index. Okay. And that helps you know whether a patient needs an RVAD or not. And this is not only for the, for the impella, but it's also for, excuse me, it's not only for the Protec, but it's also for the impella or to know if, you know, the right heart is not doing very well. Um, the caveat to the PAPI score is that you do need a PA catheter. You do need a swan to go ahead and measure this, unless you could just tell by echocardiogram uh, that the patient needs a RV help but the, the PAPI score does help out a lot. And so what you get from the actual PA catheter itself is the systolic pulmonary artery pressure, and you subtract that from the diastolic pulmonary artery pressure, and you divide these two, excuse me, you subtract these two, and you divide it by the central venous pressure, okay? And what the data I've reviewed has found is that if the PAPI score is less than 0 0.9, it indicates possible right ventricular failure and that the clinician should consider RV support. Again, this is not an absolute number, but it is something to consider. Now, if the PAPI score is greater than 0.9, it indicates that the RV is likely normal. This, this number right here would make us happy. This number over here 
would make us sad. So if the Pappy score is greater than 0.9, or in some texts, you could even see it being 1.0 or better, then in those cases, the patients are usually going to do all right. But knowing the Pappy score could tell us what direction the patient's heading to with regards to their um, to the right ventricle. Cool, cool. Like anything else that has uh, any type of plastic or any type of metal inside of the patient's body, there are complications. First and foremost, actually placing this catheter in the patient could cause all the different uh, complications that you see when placing a standard central line. The other thing is that uh, the thickness of this catheter itself is pretty darn big. So you have to you know, do quite a bit of dilating. So you could go ahead and damage the uh, internal jugular vein, and that could be a problem. Um, in addition to that, you know, there's always a risk of infection. There's a risk of bleeding that occurs from the actual site where the catheter is placed. But in addition to that, to worsen the possible complication of bleeding, you do need to anticoagulate these patients. And I've obtained that data from the brochures, excuse me, that recommend an ACT. Here, let me see if I can write this down again. So they recommend an ACT that is between 180, if this works, 180 to 220, or a PTT of 65 to 80, so that you know you won't run into any blood clots. So other questions that I had when I was looking through all this, and I'm here to try to give this to you right now, is the fact that there's not much data when it comes to outcomes and different clinical trials. There's no, uh, there's no clinical trial that I found, and I was looking at clinicaltrials.gov that give us any indication of the outcomes from these patients outside of observational data or case reports. So obviously those aren't too robust. I understand how difficult it would be to actually enroll people in these trials knowing how, um, you know, generally speaking, and thank goodness, RV failure is not something that um, that every institution sees multiple times a day, like, you know, for example, acute kidney injury. But all in all, um, thank you very much for your time. I hope that this answers some of your questions with regards to the ProTech Duo. Um, if you have any other questions, please go ahead and leave it in the comments box below, and we'll all try to get better at this. Again, um, you can see the citations that I use for this article on my website, eddiejoemd.com. And thank you very much for your attention. Have a great day.